there's a little known fact about me I bet you didn't know. I absolutely love the rock band Rush. Neil Peart, genius. For those who don't know, he was the drummer and main lyricist for the band, God rest his soul. One of the songs he helped write was called The Larger Bowl. It's a song about the differences people who are so similar may face depending on how they were born. Some might be blessed to live a good life, while others are cursed to only see the worst of humanity. It's quite frankly a sad song, but there is some truth to it, and that could be considered the theme of today's story. Naruto and Karin, despite being Uzumaki who gave their very bodies in service to their village, are reviled and treated like garbage. While Nagato, having been born lucky enough to have a Rinnegan, is treated like a king despite having done nothing. But even that must have its origins. I hope you'll join me as I weave a tale for you about two very different fates for a small group of children with the same history. Strap on your forehead protectors and cuddle up to your favorite Ninken. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, only 25% of our viewers are subscribed, so if you're a fan of the video, please like and double check if you're subscribed, and with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Uzu Shiogakure, 24 years ago. Kushina Uzumaki, a happy-go-lucky girl, felt as though nothing could go wrong. Running out of her home, there was a large field. That field had a hill with a large tree at the top, with multicolored flowers skirting the bottom of the hill like a hula dancer dancing under the radiant spotlight of the sun. It was currently 11.30 a.m., and Kushina had only now just eaten breakfast. On a nice summer day like this, sometimes it felt good to sleep in. There was no reason for her to get up early today. The village's academy was a little different from that of the other villages. Uzoshiogakure was a village that was fundamentally against sending their children to war, so summers were school-free, even during eras of war. Despite the desires of the first Hokage, even Konoha still sent children to fight in the various world wars it had seen, but not Uzushio. Uzushio had made it a point that no child would ever be forced to raise their hand in battle, not until a predetermined age that Uzushio had voted on and held as the law of their land. While other nations may force children to war, stealing the innocence of those too young to know any better and ruining the lives of the many warriors who, though honorable, were on opposing sides, who then had to live with the guilt of killing a child, living with the guilt of ending the lives of kids likely no older than their own children. Uzoshio would not. Such a thing was dishonorable, not only for their village, but to every other village, forcing their enemy to cut through their lines and lines full of children. No, Uzoshio was strong they would not force their children to war. If they stood or fell, it would be upon the backs of the adults, whose only job was to protect the children. Uzushio had even been trying to draft the bill dictating the rules of war, which would see the villages and nations making certain humanitarian agreements that would result in war becoming at least a bit less ugly. Such rules were full quarter to surrendering parties, protection of non-combatants, and a universal standard age for enlistment. Besides this, there were also a few more standards that dictated what jutsu should or shouldn't be used in battle due to the cruel nature of them. This was to be known as the Whirlpool Accords, and Uzushio had been pushing for it for years now. No other nations had signed it. Not until a few days ago. Konohagakure, Uzushio's greatest ally, despite itself being in the middle of a terrible war, had finally signed. Despite the first Hokage's will matching that of Uzoshio Gakure's, it had been like pulling teeth to get the village he once held control over to agree to the accords. And perhaps it had forced Uzoshio into a position that they did not wish to be in, forcing them to do something that they didn't want to do. Kushina was running up that hill. As the world fell apart on Uzoshio, there was some peace that could be found within this small field. There was no war in Kushina's backyard, and that made her pleased. It allowed her to continue enjoying her life the same as she always had, her and her mother and her sister. Running to the tree at the top of the hill, she saw a piece of paper held down by a stone. Kushina picked it up and began to read it. Finally out of bed, sleepyhead? Good. Well, now it's time to get even. Last time when we played hide and seek, I found you but could never catch up. Today, I'm going to settle the score. It's your turn to seek. Don't leave me waiting too long now. Kushina smiled as she read the paper. She began rushing out into the nearby woods. Ready or not, here I come, she shouted as the standard signal to inform her sister that the game had begun. She began to run within the forest, between the trees and over the stones. She crossed the creek and went deeper still, reaching the center of the holt. She looked around. She began to close her eyes and mold chakra. A common skill that was taught by Uzo Shiogakure in their academy was chakra sense. The very first things that were taught to children who likely would become prospective shinobi was survival skills, and that included how to survive in a forest by themselves. 
Beyond that, there was first aid and finally chakra sense. This, Kushina had always felt she excelled at. It at some time seemed as though she could sense chakra without even molding chakra. She felt as though she might be able to read minds with the level of chakra sense that she possessed. Even the academy was astonished at her level of advancement in this particular skill. They believed her to eventually become the head of the intelligence command in Uzoshio as she could seemingly smell a lie. And right now, she was using that ability. There were many chakras around, most of them animal. The thing was, there was one chakra that was stuck in cautious mode. It was waiting, watching. It had to be her. Kushina smiled and ran straight in that direction. Once she reached it, she began running up a tree. Suddenly, the one she was tracking began to run off. No fair, you're cheating. It's not cheating, Kushina called out. This is me being myself. I can't help if I'm just naturally good at tracking. The girl she was chasing let out a huff. Fine, if that's how you want it, don't forget that I've always been stronger and faster than you. The girl really poured on the speed. Kushina began working as hard as she could just to keep up, and despite that, it seemed like her sister was not even at her full speed yet. The balances were always askew when it came to certain traits. Some had said that if Kushina and her twin sister were born as a single person, they would have been the single greatest shinobi that Uzoshio had ever seen. Fuso, slow down! I'm not that fast! Fuso looked back and laughed. What was that you said? It's not cheating. This is me being myself. If you won't nerf yourself for me, then what makes you think I'd nerf myself for you? She let out a laugh and continued going. Fuso, ugh! Fuso immediately put on the brakes to see Kushina miss a branch. She was now hanging on for dear life. Fuso, help me. I'm slipping, Kushina said. No, you're not. You're just trying to trick me to make me come back to help you so you can win. Fuso! Suddenly, Kushina's grip failed and she fell to the ground below. Fuso hopped back to the tree limb and looked down on Kushina as she laid there. You think I'm that gullible? I know you're not as nimble as me, but even you can handle a fall like that. There was no response. Quit playing games, Kushina. It's not going to work. Not this time. Kushina didn't move. She just laid there on the ground, unmoving. Kushina, go on now. Get up. You're freaking me out. This isn't funny. Kushina remained there, motionless. Fuso felt her heart jump to her throat as the many what-ifs flooded her mind. Possibilities such as she hit her head on a rock or something when she fell, or possibly landed wrong and broke her neck. She came down beside her. Kushina? Kushina! She walked over to her and knelt down. She knew that she couldn't move Kushina. If she had broken something, that would be the worst thing she could do. She checked her pulse for a heartbeat. There was one. Suddenly, Kushina's hand raised and gripped Fuso's, causing the girl to recoil with a start. Kushina opened her eyes and smiled. Gotcha! Fuso's eyes widened in shock and then anger. You cheated, she shouted. It's not my fault you're gullible, Fuso. The girl's face began to turn red as her hair. Excuse me for thinking that your life was worth more than a silly game. Kushina sat up. All right, all right, that's fair. I won't count this time. Get back into the trees and we'll continue where we left off. I don't know if I want to play anymore. You scared me and you did it on purpose. That was mean. Kushina stood and hugged her sister. You're right. I'm sorry. That was too far. I won't do it again. Fuso stood there still trying to fume. Kushina then spoke as she hugged her. I'm grateful to have a sister who will sacrifice even her pride to make sure I'm okay. And at that, Fuso's heart melted. She took a deep breath in and heaved it out. Fine. I suppose one more time won't hurt. Kushina let her go. In exchange for my screw-up, I'll let you have a head start. Fuso got back into position as Kushina got back on the same limb she was on before. On your mark. Get set. Before they could continue, a voice called out to them from the edge of the forest. Girls, come back! It was their mother. Looks like we are done playing, Kushina said as she looked back. Fuso scoffed. I still have a score to settle. As soon as we figure out what mom wants, I'm smoking you. And this time, no more dirty tricks. Together, they began to make their way back to their home. Coming into the clearing, they passed over the hill and began to head back to the small house where they lived. They entered the door. Mom, we're back. What do you need? They walked into the living room to see their mother sitting with two men wearing the Uzo Shiogakure symbol on their forehead protectors. What's going on? Fuso asked. Their mother seemed a little upset. Girls, sit down, please. The girls, now on high alert, took a seat. One of the men turned to face them. Are these the girls? The mother nodded. Which one is which? Their mother pointed to each of them. The girl on the left is Fuso, and the girl on the right is Kushina. The man knelt down in front of them. My, what beautiful girls you are. It's a pleasure to meet you. I am Naito, a Tokubetsu Jonin under the Aishina II, Chief of Foreign Affairs. What do you want with us? Fuso asked. Naito continued. We're here to choose one of you for a very special role. What do you mean? Kushina asked. We're children. 
Naito nodded. Indeed, but there is a role that we need one of you for. Naito turned to Kushina. Kushina, you have been chosen to be the next Jinchuriki of the Ninetales in Konoha. Kushina was confused. Huh? Naito began to explain. A Jinchuriki is a human who... No, I know about that, but why do you need me? She asked. It's because you have abilities no other Uzumaki has displayed. The ability to sense emotions and chakra. This ability is believed to make you worthy of becoming the perfect Jinchuriki that was foretold at the foundation of this village. Kushina was confused and yet somehow intrigued. So you'll seal this nine tails into me? We won't, Naito said. What does that mean? Fuso asked. Kushina, you are going to be sent to Konoha to live. There they will seal the nine tails away inside of you. Kushina was shocked. She began to panic. Wait, you mean I'll have to leave my mom and sister? Naito nodded. You don't know how important this is for the village, Kushina. For years, Uzoshio has been trying to pass international laws, limiting the cruelty of war, bringing civility to battle, and saving untold numbers of lives. Nobody would sign it until a few days ago. Konoha signed the treaty, but they asked one thing in return. You. Why me? Kushina demanded. Because they believe you to be the perfect Jinchuriki that was spoken of in times past, and we have to agree. You can't send her, Fuso stated with boldness. It's against the law. You can't enlist a child. You think we're idiots? Konoha is signing the treaty, but only if you allow them to break it? Impossible. Naito looked down. We thought of that already. Konoha has informed us that they won't make Kushina a member of active service until six years pass, when she'll be of legal age according to the Whirlpool Conventions. The reason why they want her now and why we're allowing this is because turning one into a Jinchuriki at a young age leaves them flexible. The older they are, the more rigid the Jinchuriki. The younger, the better. The less developed a child is, the more the connection between them and their tailed beast grows. They wish to seal it into her while she's still primed for her position as a perfect Jinchuriki. Then they'll train her to use its power. Naito then drew closer to Kushina. He took her hands and held them. Kushina, I know it's scary, but Konoha has promised to treat you like a princess. You'll be given the best the village has to offer, and you'll be treated kindly with respect. But... What about my family? She asked, tears starting to well up in her eyes. I don't think I have the strength to leave them. To say goodbye to my mom and sister forever? I don't think I can do that. Naito looked down. Kushina, I know you're scared, but you're stronger than you know. The village is asking you to make a sacrifice for the greater good. Doing this for the village, it will save many lives. If Konoha follows through with the accords, the rest of the world will have no choice but to follow suit. Konoha is sitting at the world table and has decided to take the left napkin. The rest of the world will have no choice but to take that left napkin as well or risk disrupting the peace that has only recently been won. I don't know if you've heard, but the Second Shinobi World War is over, and now is the perfect time to draft this bill. If the world agrees, then war will fundamentally change forever, will become more humane, and will see the protection of innocence. Please, Kushina. Think about what the world stands to gain if you make a small sacrifice, please. Kushina looked to her mother, who waited patiently for her answer with a look of sorrow upon her face. But she powered into a smile to tell Kushina that no matter what she chose, it was okay. Kushina then looked to Fuso, who seemed confused that Kushina would even consider this at all. Fuso shook her head as if to tell Kushina no. Kushina then looked down at Naito, who was still pleading with her to accept this new role. This was the first time that a decision for Kushina's future was left to her to decide. Worse still, it was more than just a decision that affected her. It was a decision that affected the entire world. Turning her gaze back to Naito, she asked, Can you promise me that you'll always take care of my mother and sister for the rest of their lives? Naito nodded. Yes. Uzoshio will gladly take care of their needs. They'll never worry for finances or anything, and will have access to whatever they need without exception. Kushina gulped and took a deep breath to gather willpower. She then forced the words out of her mouth. I'll do it. Kushina, no, Fuso demanded. You can't do this. Kushina looked to her. This will be good for you. You won't worry for anything, ever. But that's not what I care about. I don't care about money or anything. I just want you. She hugged Kushina. Kushina listened as Fuso cried on her shoulder. She pat her back. It's okay, Fuso. But I'm not doing this just for you and mom. I'm doing this for Uzoshio. I'm doing this for the world. Both girls were crying now. Even their mother was crying. Naito stood and looked at his compatriot. Come, let's give them a moment alone. After the family had finished grieving for the future, Kushina was sent to a room to collect the things that she needed. She then went to join the two Jonin. Naito put his hand on her shoulder. It's gonna be okay, Kushina. 
Third Hokage Hiruzen has promised to put you up in the Hokage's residence. He's a very kind and generous man, one of the kindest men you'll ever meet. He'll treat you like a man would his granddaughter. You'll be cared for. Kushina nodded. She then said goodbye to her family and began to walk off. Fuso and her mother stood there and watched. Fuso couldn't grasp it. Why did the world require Kushina of all people? Her mother attributed it to destiny, to a grand plan, written for her before the day her soul was even sculpted by the father himself. While none of them were excited about this plan for her life, it didn't stop that it was coming. We just gotta have faith that this is for the best, her mother said. Somehow this will work out for the better. Such a concept she held, but even Fuso herself began to wonder how it could work for the better when their little village was surrounded by the enemy. As their very way of life was being crushed, as her mother's life slipped away from her in Fuso's arms, Fuso wondered how this was for the best when everyone they loved was dying. Fuso, being ever so quick and nimble, fled to the forest, outrunning any shinobi that had come after her. She left Uzoshi Ogakure forever as the village fell to the hands of shinobi without forehead protectors. She began to flee. She wanted to leave it all behind. Uzoshio, Konoha, everything. In the span of a few months, her happy life was ruined because of war, the threat of it, and the attempted prevention of it. She didn't stop moving, didn't stop walking, didn't stop heading west until eventually the weather began to mirror her constant mood. Nothing but rain for days, weeks even. A sunny day seemed as rare here as a rainy day in Suna. As for Kushina, she had been spending her time in Konoha, saddened as well. First, because she had to leave her family behind, and second, because she knew that her clan had fallen with her village of origin. That, coupled with the terror of having to take a demonic entity into her, seemed so much. She had Mito to guide her, though, which brought her some peace. Mito knew what the girl had lost, and what she had yet to sacrifice. She knew that Kushina really just needed a win, so she gave her a secret. The way to control the Ninetales was through love. She should consider searching for suitors, which she did eventually in Minato Namikaze, who would go on to become Hokage. Kushina would take in the Ninetales, becoming its Jinchuriki, though it was discovered after this that her trauma continued to follow her, which made it impossible for her to be the perfect Jinchuriki that they had spoken of. That likely had been a factor in the escape of the Ninetales during the birth of Karin and Naruto. It was after this that the world began to show hatred toward Karin and Naruto, due to the trauma they had all felt from the escape of the Ninetales, an event that left the village shredded. Naruto and Karin, now being blamed for the event in general, were left to pick up the pieces of their life, as Konoha gradually began to forget about their sacrifice. That wasn't the only thing Konoha forgot, though. An investigation was launched into the destruction of Uzoshi Ogakure. As it turned out, there were many reasons why Uzoshi Ogakure had fallen. One was because of the threat of the perfect Jinchuriki, which they believed could destroy the current world order, and it also had to do with the Whirlpool Accords. The world knew that they couldn't take that left napkin, knowing that doing so would severely limit their options, which would make smaller and weaker nations eventually subservient to Konoha. So they opted to destroy Uzushio and the Accords to keep from falling under Konoha's thumb. Without Uzushio, the villages just continued what they were doing. Konoha, after seeing this as well, would themselves abandon the Accords and act as if they never happened, knowing that they could not allow themselves to be handicapped while the other nations were not. Due to discovering the truth of who was behind the attacks on Uzoshio, they planned to take their vengeance out on them, which led to the beginning of the Third Shinobi World War. But this is not where the story ends for our heroes. No, you see, we still need to follow Fuso. Fuso, now living as a refugee in Amegakure, would end up living on the streets as a child, going hungry. That was until a boy found her. His name was Issei, and he was the son of a prominent physician. After finding her, he petitioned his father to help. Considering that it was a doctor's duty to ensure that anyone and everyone was well cared for physically, Fuso was taken in and nursed back to health. And considering her history, the fact that she had nowhere else to go, and due to the fact that Ame hadn't spared any money to feed or care for orphans, they decided just to care for her, because Issei's father could not in good consciousness send a girl he just nursed back to health back out into the cruel world, where the same thing would happen for another time. They decided to allow her to live with them, but as times changed and years passed, Issei began studying to follow in his father's footsteps, becoming a physician himself. However, he refused to enlist in Ame's shinobi forces. He could not. Not after his father, who had cared for them both his entire life, was killed in action fighting in the Third Shinobi World War. No. Issei dedicated his life to the preservation of lives, not the taking of them. He chose to instead join a humanitarian organization called Medical Nin Without Borders, which would send aid to other small villages that had been devastated due to the war. It was during this time that Fuso grew pregnant with her and Issei's first child. 
Giving birth to him, they named him Nagato, after Issei's father. But they quickly came to learn that the boy was different from other children. He possessed ringed eyes. Having him checked out by physicians, hoping they could determine what this all meant, it was revealed that their son might be the fulfillment of a different prophecy that stated that the one bearing the eyes of the Sage of Six Paths would come to set up a new world order of either peace or destruction. Due to this, Fuso and Issei were provided for, and everything was offered to them to help the development of the child. However, one might have been able to take the animal out of the wild, but never could they take the wild out of the animal. Fuso and Issei, stubborn and dutiful as they were, continued to work humanitarian, oftentimes using some of the funds that Ame allotted to them to help with their efforts to aid villages that had gone through devastating attacks from larger nations, something Fuso felt very passionate about due to her own experiences. Sadly, they stuck their heads in too deep and ended up being caught up in a raid on a village, and during this raid they were killed, leaving their toddler son alone. But this was not the end for Nagato. Amegakure would officially take up the child themselves and put him into the household of Hanzo the Salamander until such a time as the old lizard died. It was a day unexpected and sudden. The poison sack he had implanted into himself ruptured and poisoned him. He would eventually be replaced. Nagato lived a life of plenty and was treated with respect as if he were king. He'd also be trained and allowed personal tutors to help him grow as a shinobi. By this time, the Third Shinobi World War had drawn to a close and Konoha was in good standing with Ame. So Ame decided that the best way to help Nagato grow would be to send him there as an exchange student. And that is exactly what they did. Nagato packed up his bags and was sent off to Konoha to learn. He arrived in the village a little after noon. He looked around and was astonished. There was nary a cloud in the sky. No, they basked in the sunlight all day every day. It blew his mind. As he passed into the village, he kept the bangs of his hair forward to slightly conceal his rinnegan in hopes of not drawing unwanted attention. Wait up, young Master Nagato, shouted two others behind him. He looked back and saw a man and woman running his way, two of the most powerful shinobi ever to be brought up in Amegakure, loyal to their village yet pacifistic. Never before had they killed. Even when they had gone to war for the village during the Third Shinobi World War, they did everything in their power not to kill. This seemed impossible, but the completion of this feat required them to be strong, which is how they became elite. It also served as proof that they were worthy of their task. They were the personal guards of Nagato. Their names were Yahiko and Konin, both in their early 30s. They caught up with him. What will the Amekage think if we lose the second Sage of Six Paths? Nagato offered a slight bow. My apologies. I didn't mean to frighten you, I merely got excited is all. Konin, catching her breath, let it aside. It's okay, just try and stick with us. We'll be sure to visit all the places you're interested in later, but first we need to visit the Hokage. He's graciously accepted you into this village as a student. We ought to go pay him a visit and speak with him about the exchange. Nagato nodded. The woman took up the young man's hand and the trio began to make their way to the Hokage's office. Upon hearing that Nagato had arrived, the secretary informed the Hokage and then cleared his entire evening just in case the meeting spilled over. They opened the door and stepped inside. Hirazin was sitting at the table. He stood up and walked around it. With a slight clap of his hands, he smiled. Welcome, honored guests. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. He stepped forward. I assume you are the emissaries of Amegakure, Master Yahiko and Mistress Konin. They nodded and Yahiko spoke. You seem well acquainted with us. If so, then I assume we have no need to introduce young Master Nagato here. Hirazin nodded. He took Nagato's hand and kissed it. Welcome, Sage, he said. He led them deeper into his office. You are free to sit anywhere you please. Hirazin then sat down in his seat. Nagato sat down and Yahiko hovered above him. Konan sat on the other side. Hirazin then began to speak. It's an honor for Konoha to host the esteemed second sage of six paths. It's our hope that we might educate him and help him grow into a powerful shinobi, so he might eventually bring the world to peace. Konan bowed her head slightly in respect to the Hokage. Ame is pleased to be able to share this with you, Lord Third, with you and your wonderful village. After all, it's believed that this is the land where the first sage, Hagoromo, settled and began the very first school of Ninshu. It's our deepest desire that by tracing the steps of the previous sage, that Master Nagato might gain an understanding of the things that made the first sage of six paths so great. All the while they were talking, Nagato was no longer paying attention. He couldn't help that he had the attention span of a koi fish. He was too busy playing with the obi of his kimono. He looked at it. For as long as he could remember, this had been the style of his formal wear. It made him feel a bit embarrassed walking around so fancifully, but it was what was demanded of him, a white kimono. 
Around the collar, there were black magatama lining it. On the back, there was a pattern of nine magatama in a 3x3 three three row, just under a ringed circle that Nagato could only assume represented his Rinnegan. Nagato had been taught the history of the Sage of Six Paths, how after banishing the evil rabbit goddess, the sage set about spreading chakra and ninjutsu to the rest of the world, believing that they could use it to grow closer and protect each other, only for it to be developed into a weapon that the world would use to destroy itself. They had told Nagato that he was destined to change this, and instate a brand new world order where things could no longer occur like this. But to be perfectly honest, Nagato was not sure how to go about doing this. Despite being so young, he was actually far from being ignorant. Whether it was by benefit of his tutoring or perhaps just a natural gift bestowed upon him by his Rinnegan was unknown, but he was smart enough to see the world for what it truly was, and he just saw a world where war was natural. The world wasn't something he could just change. Even if he was some sage of six paths like Hagoromo, he was still just a human being, and that meant he had limits. His Rinnegan had limits. He had already known that it wasn't impossible for him to bring someone who died back to life, but doing such a feat in earnest, by which I mean actually bringing the dead back to life, as in restoring their soul to their body, was something that did have a cost. A life for a life. If he restored someone who had died, he himself would die. There were limits. There were prices to pay. Nagato might have had access to certain jutsu that others did not, some that might be considered by others miracles, but Nagato knew he was not a god. He was still just a regular human being born with a Kekai Genkai that had not been seen for generations. So how was he supposed to change the world? How was he supposed to stop war? Everyone blamed the war for utilizing these sages ninjutsu as weapons against each other, but the thing is, ninjutsu was a tool. It was a tool to make life easier. To connect with others, yes, but the very fact that one could summon lightning and fire and control the elements, well, that made it perfect for war. The sage had made every man the master of all elements, and because of this, wars could be fought. And why shouldn't they? What was the practical use for calling down lightning? What was the practical use of fire-style jutsu so large it could burn down forests? It was the sage of six paths that had set the world on a collision course with war. It was all well and good that people could sense each other, but was the sage really going to expect human beings to be responsible with this power? Humans were weak, and when they didn't get what they wanted or something was done to them, they would shed blood over it. Such a thing was normal. Common, even. And even if the sage had not given the rest of humanity chakra, it would have still gone to war. As long as humans had the means to harm each other, they would. That was a basic law of humanity, of society as a whole. It was something that Nagato didn't think could be removed from the world. How was he supposed to bring peace? People far greater and far smarter than he had tried for generations to bring peace and had failed. What was it that Nagato was going to do any differently? His Rinnegan couldn't just magically solve any problem, he had limits. Suddenly, Nagato was elbowed in the shoulder. Huh? He looked up. Yahiko looked down at him. Lord Hirazin asked you a question, Nagato. Nagato looked back at Hirazin and offered a slight bow. My apologies, Lord Third. I was in my own head and missed your question. Hirazin smiled. It's perfectly all right. I was merely asking you if you wanted to perhaps join in on the academy tomorrow. It would be the last day of the school week. You could just sit out and wait until this Monday if you'd prefer, but I assumed you might want the option. Nagato thought about it for a moment. I will be attending this Monday, correct? Hirazin nodded. Indeed. Nagato thought about it. Yes, I would like to join in tomorrow so I can begin getting settled and getting to know the other students. Eager to make friends, Hirazin said. That's perfect. I will inform the schoolmaster of your imminent arrival and attendance tomorrow. For now, we've allotted you and your guardians a home. It was once owned by the first Hokage before he had the estate built. It has since been heavily renovated to serve as the guest house for honored visitors such as yourselves. Feel free to make yourselves at home. If there's anything you need that we can provide, do not hesitate to reach out. Your hospitality is highly appreciated, Conan said as she stood. Nagato followed suit. Standing, he looked at the older man through his crimson bangs. Hirazin smiled at him, which caused Nagato to do the same. Naruto and Kareen woke up. Kareen was always the first one awake. Despite being roughly the same age, she was the one who was taking on the responsibilities. Her mother had left a large hole, and that hole demanded to be filled. So Kareen filled it. She let Naruto sleep in an extra 30 minutes while she made breakfast. After that, she would wake Naruto up and the two would share a nice breakfast together. Kareen then demanded to be the first in the bathroom, which Naruto couldn't deny. Kareen demanded reparation. There was still some child left in her. After this, they began to make their way to school. The day before had been hard, and today it would be hard as well. 
they still had six days of detention owed to the academy. This in particular was not just because she threatened another student or because she disobeyed the teacher, but this was for striking another student. And while kids would be kids, they needed to know that hitting another person without reason was not okay. But considering that they were training children to be weapons of war, she began to question what was considered reasonable. To be frank though, Corrine was not in the mood to dive deeply into the inner machinations of the human mind today. She just wasn't in a good mood, and it had caused her to lose sleep the night before. They both filed into the classroom. They were a little late, but not enough to be tardy. By the looks of things though, on the outside of the academy, something big was happening. There was press and paparazzi. Is that him? They asked as they started taking pictures of Kareen. Oh, no, never mind. What's their deal? Kareen asked as she got inside. Naruto shrugged. I don't know. Maybe the Hokage is coming to pay a visit? They entered the classroom and took their seats. As they did so, they passed by Sasuke, who was attempting to avoid eye contact with the both of them. Taking their seat, they didn't have to wait long until Iraka came in. There was a commotion outside, but Kareen couldn't see what it was. Iraka was standing at the door. This was all very strange. What was going on here? A few minutes later, the door opened. Two adults walked in, one male with orange hair and another female with blue hair. Not long after, a boy in a well-to-do kimono walked in. He possessed red hair and pale skin. Kareen sat forward when she saw it. Something seemed familiar about this boy. Who was he? As the boy stepped in, Erika spoke with the adult standing above the boy. They spoke with Erika, joked, laughed a bit, and then departed, leaving the boy alone with Erika. The boy stood there for a moment as Erika prepared to address the students. All that fuss for one boy? Naruto asked. Who is he? Why does everyone want to take his picture? Erika then spoke. Class, we have a very special student joining us today. I hope you'll make him feel comfortable. Erika then turned to the boy. He spoke in a way that the class couldn't hear him, but Kareen read his lips. He was asking if the boy would like to be introduced or if he'd like to introduce himself. The boy chose the latter. He stepped forward. Hi, I'm an exchange student from Amegakure. Some have called me the second sage of six paths, but I'd prefer to be called a friend. My name is Nagato, Nagato Uzumaki. The class began to clamor over the concept of sharing their school days with the second sage of six paths, but it held all the more meaning for Karin and Naruto, who both looked to each other with surprise. N Nagato Uzumaki? They watched as the boy stood there. He was waiting for the class to settle down before making his way up, afraid that he might be overtaken and washed away by their waves of excitement. Erika managed to get a handle on his class, as was his job. Settle down, class, settle down. As he managed to quiet them, he continued. While it certainly is very exciting to have the next Sage of Six Paths here in class with us, it's also important to remember what he's here for. He's here to learn just the same as the rest of us, so please try to treat him as any other student. Don't make a big deal about it, harass, or distract him from his studies. He then allowed Nagato to take a seat. Nagato found one in the back of the class, away from the other kid's attention. As he settled down, Kareen couldn't help but watch him. Naruto then spoke. Wow, his clan name is also Uzumaki. Crazy coincidence, right? Kareen, still watching Nagato, replied, Yeah, coincidence. And that's where I'd like to stop it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed getting to explore the history behind Naruto and Kareen's family, but I thought it would be cool to have them related to Nagato, insinuating that twins run in the family. Kushina had a twin too. The way Kushina was sent off to be pampered while Fuso suffered all her life stood in contrast to the way that Nagato is pampered while Naruto and Kareen suffer. But it was also important to emphasize that even though Nagato and Kushina were pampered, they had a different level of expectation. Some say that there's no such thing as a free meal. I don't entirely believe that, as some things just have to be given to you. But what Kushina and Nagato experienced was not one of those things. They have responsibilities and expectations to meet, and that redefined their blessings as responsibilities. But enough prattle. I hope you truly enjoyed this video. If you did, let us know in the comments and tell us what you'd like to see in the next part. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell to be notified when more videos like this drop. And just to keep you occupied until said videos do drop, check out these other videos. Until next time, peace.